Yo, so guys, welcome back to another video. This is another space type reaction, and I'm gonna be honest, this video literally just popped in my feed. On my, I was scrolling from my phone on my personal YouTube, and I just saw it pop up and I screenshotted, and I thought this could be a, an interesting reaction, as I usually say. But generally, the, the, the title of this did actually. Oh, just hit my elbow. <laughs> my funny. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. Um, what was I saying? Oh, why did I hit my funny bow, bro? Um, what was I saying? Um,. Yeah, was it to do with the title? The, the, the title? the title of the video is actually something that I'm feeling like a lot of people will be interested in seeing. Some people may know the story, but some people may not. It's also a new post. It was literally a month ago today. And the title was Free Men Lost in Space, The Apollo 13 Disaster. It's something that I don't actually feel like I've ever heard about. The Apollo 13 Disaster, I probably have heard of the specific thing, but I've not looked into it. I don't know much about it. I don't know when it was, all these different things. And yeah, again, three men lost in space. This is going to be a wild video, but we're going to check this out. Hopefully you're going to enjoy. Quick shout out to my Instagram. My Twitter link's in the description for those. Save my Patreon links were there. A lot of Patreon exclusive videos have been posted in the last week or so. But yeah, let's give us a watch. Let's see what this video is about. And maybe I could see some more videos from this channel. We'll just have to see. Another episode of Cold Fusion. What do LASIK surgeries and GPS have in common? How Wait, what the fuck? Oh, is an ad. Post cloud shout out to him getting his money. You know how it is, bro. Oh. I'm so confused. Cloud computing connected to invisible braces. Did you know that scratch resistant lenses were related to dust busters? Actually, all of these things have NASA to credit for their existence. Is this an ad? <laughs> is this even an ad? It's not an ad, but is it? Wait, I'm so confused. Did I just say shut up for getting your money when he's not even having an advert? I'm so confused. Yes, from the scratch resistant lenses in your glasses to LASIK surgery that rids you of those very glasses. All are products of technologies developed by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA as we call it. Contrary to popular Shall belief NASA that NASA is all about world. sending rovers to other planets and getting beautiful pictures, in reality, the space agency is a part of our daily lives and we don't even realize it. <coughs> Still, the primary job of NASA is the exploration of the universe. A lot of you have probably seen the recent images of the Mars rover landing. Yeah, getting the craft crazy, to land on Mars was hard, but it's exponentially more difficult to send humans into space and getting them back is even more difficult. Radiation and absence of oxygen and water, escaping the Earth's gravity and re-entering the Earth's atmosphere are all factors that make space travel extremely perilous. Now, imagine the scale of a disaster if an accident takes place in the void of space. Human lives will be lost in the vast emptiness forever. This almost happened half a century ago, in April of 1970, on Apollo 13. Oh! What followed, though, is a marvellous story of human grit, undeterred resolve, on-the-spot innovation, and unshakable perseverance. A true story that is comparable to any edge-of-your-seat sci-fi thriller. Was I was assuming from the title people would have died from this, but I guess we're going to find out what truly happened, but... God damn! Yeah. Wait, is this the... I'm gonna get laughed at. Is this the Houston we have a problem? Is that just for a film? Was that... That is an actual event, wasn't it? Event? Like, a thing from space. Is that what this was about? We're gonna see. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. In the early 1960s, when the Soviets seemed to be winning the space race by first sending a dog, and later, a man by the name of Yuri Gagarin to space, the then US President, John F. Kennedy, challenged America to the ultimate goal, to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. The dream was fulfilled when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon on July 20th, 1969 for the Apollo 11 mission. Earlier, the Apollo 7, 8, 9 and 10 missions had been sent to the moon, but none of them involved a human landing on the lunar surface. With Apollo 13, NASA wanted to land astronauts in the Fra Mauro area of the moon. This is a geologically tougher landing site and is supposed to have been formed by an asteroid impact. For the Apollo 13 mission, the mission setup of the craft was in three parts. The cone-shaped command module, where the three men would be for most of the trip. The spider-like lunar module that would carry two of the three astronauts to the moon. And lastly, the service module. It was a large cylindrical craft with the main engines and oxygen tanks. During the mission, the service module would orbit the moon and rejoin with a jettisoned capsule that blasted off from the lunar module after the moonwalk was complete. Oh, mad. This all had to be perfectly timed, a feat done by two onboard guidance computers, 
one in the orbiting command module and the other in the lunar module. Like the previous two Apollo missions, the crew consisted of three men. Mission commander, James Lovell, father of four and highly experienced. Command module pilot, John Swigert, a last minute step in for another astronaut who had been exposed to the measles. And lastly, oh, lunar module pilot, Fred Hayes, a rookie who left his wife and three kids on Earth. For a mission being so interesting, no one showed much interest when Apollo 13 took flight at 2.37 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on April 11th, 1970. The measles came in clutch at this point, bro, because if you experience this, he's probably thankful he had those measles at that point. Half but, days, uh, the trio would be walking on the moon. Perhaps by now, the last two Apollo missions made a walk on the moon seem more like a walk in the park. Even the live telecast of the crew flying through space all the way to the moon wasn't broadcast by major networks. But little did anyone know that within 10 minutes of the completion of the broadcast, something would happen that would pique the interest of the entire world. But for now, things were going well. While traveling at about 40,000 kilometers per hour, the crew would perform an 180 degree turn to dock the lunar module and leave the spent main rocket behind. They were now on their way to the moon. Everything was going smoothly. Quote, We're bored to tears down here, said Joe, the capsule communicator, at 46 hours and 43 minutes. But unbeknownst to the crew, just a few meters below where they sat, there were some cracked wires next to a highly flammable oxygen tank. <coughs> at 55 hours and 46 minutes, the crew finished the TV broadcast, in which the rookie Fred Hayes pulled a few practical jokes on his crew. His favorite was to push the repressurization valve, which produces a large banging noise. They were now 322,000 oh, kilometers away from Earth, four-fifths of the way to the moon. Yeah, the repressurization that? valve, which produces a large banging noise. They were now 322,000 kilometers away from Earth, four-fifths of the way to the moon. At around this time, Jack turned on the fans to stir oxygen tanks one and two in the service module. Unfortunately for all on board, the cracked wires were now exposed. Tank number two exploded with a bang. Oh my days. They all looked at each other, thinking Fred Hayes was playing another prank. But this time, Fred was just as stunned as the other two. At this moment, the master alarm light and an electrical power failure warning was triggered. Oh, it is. Houston, oh, we have a problem here. These were the famous words that Mission Commander James Lovell reported to Mission Control. Meanwhile, down on Earth, Mission Control couldn't believe what they were seeing. The warning lights indicated the loss of two of three fuel cells. They were the spacecraft's primary source of electricity. They realized that one oxygen tank was completely empty and the oxygen in the second tank was depleting. The engineers at Mission Control were scrambling to figure out what was wrong. There couldn't possibly be this many failures at once, or the crew would be dead. It's as you, you fall back upon your simulation training and you start working the problem and you work it the best you can. I was thinking that it was solvable and then I was coming to the conclusion that I couldn't solve it. That wasn't a good feeling. But to the dismay of the engineers monitoring on Earth, the catastrophic failures were confirmed within a few minutes, and quite horrifyingly so. When James Lovell happened to glance out the left window, he could see a gas leaking. It was the oxygen from the second and the only remaining tank. Oh my at this goodness. moment, the crew knew that they were in big trouble. Amazingly, they didn't panic, as they knew that that would solve nothing. We never panicked, and, and, and people often ask me why we never panicked, and the, the fact is we could have bounced off the walls for about 10 minutes, and when we finished, we'd be back where we started from. As the crew watched their precious oxygen leak out, they realized that they would lose all oxygen and soon, subsequently, their last fuel cell. They were now without electricity, light, and water 200,000 miles away from Earth, and still traveling rapidly in the wrong direction. Landing on the moon was out of the question now. The first thing they had to do was correct their trajectory. The explosion had shifted them off course, and if they didn't correct, they would still swing around the moon, but upon their return, they would miss the Earth completely. What? As the disaster unfolded, the news media began picking up the story. From ABC News Space Headquarters, there has been an emergency flight of Apollo 13. 
some kind of explosion occurred in the spacecraft's main engine. The explosion affected the spacecraft's main power system supplied by fuel cells. This is and that means to... that their oxygen supply is in jeopardy and their water supply is officially termed critical. The whole Earth was now watching, including the families of those in space. I thought to myself, May. something's wrong. You know, my dad's never coming back. I'm never going to see my dad again. And, um, you know, he's basically, you know, I, I basically felt at that point that he was dead. With no propulsion possible from the damaged service module, at one hour and 29 seconds after the explosion, the decision was made from the monitoring engineers on the ground that the crew should use the lunar module as a lifeboat. It wasn't going to be easy, though. How would the oxygen supply be maintained? What would happen when power runs out? Was there enough food on the lunar module? What about water? How was the crew going to navigate back to Earth? Bro, there were so many, there's so many different like possibilities. Bro, this is mental. Oh my God. See, again, I knew I, I knew I had heard of the Apollo 13 thing because of the saying, Houston, we have a problem. And obviously the name of it just rings a bell, but I didn't know the in-depth details to it. And mate, this is mental. I can't wrap my head around how like, how they got out of this situation. No, the, the oxygen's running out, the, the lack of food, poss the possibilities of lack of food, the electricity, like whatever's going on with that, just all these different things, bro. The trajectory of getting back to work, it's just like, how did they get out of this situation, man? All systems in the command module, except the critical ones, had to be shut down in order to conserve power. This would drop the temperature inside the craft to below freezing. And oh they didn't know days. if the guidance instruments could take that cold temperature. The guidance system is like your eyes and your foot on the throttle and your hands on the steering wheel. It's the information that gives you the ability to, if you will, steer from one point to another. And so the question was, is would the instruments be able to take the cold temperature? With only 15 minutes of power and oxygen left in the damaged service module, they all made their way to the lunar module. Thankfully in all of this, there was one bright spot. Surplus oxygen in the lunar module, but only for a while. It wasn't an ideal situation, but it was going to have to do. Clem was a flimsy looking spidery type vehicle. Uh, the crew compartment had no amenities whatsoever. It didn't even have seats. The skin of the crew compartment was about 12 thousandths of an inch thick aluminum. That would be like uh, three layers of Reynolds wrap uh, put together. You could easily, if you were careless, put your, your boot or your foot uh, right through what? Uh, that wall. Yes, that's right. If someone moved their foot the wrong way, it could puncture the craft and their oxygen could escape. Oh my fuck. Bro, this just gets worse and worse. And they'd all die. Meanwhile, on the ground, the manufacturers of the lunar module were hard at work calculating how long it could support the life of three people instead of two, as it had originally been designed. They calculated two days, but how long would it take for them to get home? Nobody knew yet. So the main question still remained, how do you bring the three men back home? They had two options. The crew could use the main engine to try and get back to Earth as quickly as possible, but run the risk of engine failure. Or they could take an extra one to two days to use the moon's gravity and fling them back towards Earth. They decided to go for the second option. Really? They were going to go around the moon. This involved using the lunar module's rocket, which was never designed for this purpose, but even less so with the command module still attached. They went around the moon. Oh my. And they used the gravity to like sling itself. Bro, science is nuts, bro. Science is nuts, but this is just, <laughs> they went past the moon. That's, that's, that must be so like, not degrading, because at that point you just want to get back to earth. But for them, like their, their whole mission was to get to the moon. And now they had to go past the moon and go around it and come back to Earth. Bro, I, this is mental. The center man. of gravity was now completely off, so the controls no longer corresponded to the inputs given. If you tried to turn left, it would pitch up, or if you tried pitching down, it would go to the right. Mate, it was like flying a fighter jet, but with all the control labels switched, they had no choice but to try. A 35 second <laughs> rocket burn was carried out to speed up the craft. But the calculations made back on Earth said that they would run out of power and water before coming home. They needed more speed. But how were they going to figure out how to get up to speed? 
The onboard computer was very primitive. For context, this was a year before Intel had invented the CPU microprocessor. The Apollo computer could only store a few thousand numbers in RAM, and its power was orders of magnitude less than even a basic Nokia phone from decades ago. What the f Because of this reason, all the calculations had to be done on the ground, and the instructions radioed back about when to fire the rocket, at exactly what power level, and for how long. The crew had to copy the instructions precisely before they lost radio contact when they travelled behind the moon. The calculations suggested that a burner of 5 minutes would cut 24 hours off the travel time, but it might not have been enough. After the first uh, hour or so, as we began to gather the data, and we saw those data points, uh, you know, heading down, it became obvious that within, you know, an hour or so that we weren't going to make it at that rate. The biggest power consumer on the lunar module is the guidance system. Merritt feels it's essential to turn it off, but Lunny and Krantz feel just as strongly it has to stay up and running so the crew can position the ship. Glenn, if we don't get this thing powered down, uh, we're not going to make it. And, uh, of course, Glenn uh, was receptive and I said, well, let's see your data. You know, once you looked at the data and, and the data was coming in, you know, it was obvious we weren't going to make it. They decided to leave the guidance computer on for now and then turn everything off and float to Earth in below freezing temperatures for three days. Oh my God. To conserve water, the crew had to cut down their intake to about a fifth of normal. Worse, they were requested to not eject urine into space so they wouldn't disturb the flight's trajectory. This meant that the crew had to store their waste in bags and practically stop drinking water. They became dehydrated, cold, sleep deprived, and Fred Hayes developed a bladder infection and then a fever. The other two crew members would wrap their bodies around him to keep him warm. Mate. They were miserable. Fuck. By now, the entire world was following the updates of Apollo 13. If I may be serious for one moment and ask the entire audience for a moment of prayer for the crewmen of the Apollo 13. We'll hold silence for a moment, please. Countries offered help, and people across the globe prayed. The world watched as a dangerous adventure unfolded, an adventure that wouldn't be paralleled by any other in years to come. But even so, there were even more problems. The three men were creating excess carbon dioxide that needed to be expelled or they would suffocate. The lunar module was running out of carbon dioxide filters, but the command module had plenty of spares. The only issue was that the openings of the two filters were not compatible so everyone had to get creative. The problem was that we had these square canisters, and in the lunar module, the receptacle in which you put the CO2 filters was round, because the lunar module uses, used round uh, canisters or filters instead of square ones. So our problem was, how do we connect this square canister to a system that will only accept round uh, filters? With at least two more days of the journey still left, the challenge, however, was that Mission Control could only build prototypes and the actual method had to be built by the crew as per the instructions from the ground. Even just describing the contraption was hard. Thankfully, the crew managed to do so using plastic bags, cardboard and duct tape. What? Even what? after solving the problems of power, water, food and excess carbon dioxide, the biggest challenge still remained. Getting back to Earth. The touchdown was planned for the Pacific, but the craft could land in an unspecified range of hundreds of miles. Mm. Re-entry itself was a gamble. Coming home from- Wait, does it float? I guess it floats, because on the Pacific- Bro, this- This- Even this would scare me, ha scare me, having to land in the ocean, in the middle of the ocean. Bro. Bro this is the you had to come in and hit the atmosphere in a re-entry corridor that was only two degrees wide, a pie-shaped wedge, not any less than five and a half degrees, not any greater than seven and a half degrees. You had to come down that two degree wedge. If you came in too shallow, you'd skip out, like skipping a stone on water. If you came in too steep, well, that sudden deceleration would make you a fiery meteor over the sky for a few brief seconds. Because they were coming in too shallow and the guidance computer was still powered off, the crew needed to course correct by hand. 
they had to line up the earth in the centre of their window and hope for the best. Whilst freezing cold, whilst with no sleep, whilst not being able to eat or drink or whatever, whilst... I know that when that engine goes on... Whilst sick. ...that I'll never be able to keep the earth in the window by myself, because these are what we call three attitude, uh, th attitude controllers, and pitch and roll and yaw. I said, you take your attitude controller and keep the earth from going back and forth too much. I'll keep, I'll take my attitude controller and keep the earth from going up and down too much. He said, fine. And then over on the side, I had a couple of buttons. Uh, one said start and one said stop. These were buttons that directly connected the battery to the decent engine. The one and only time they were ever used in the Apollo program. At the proper time, Jack said start. I hit the start button. The engine went on. 14 seconds later, Jack said stop. I hit the stop button, and in between that time, we juggled the earth, you know, up and down and sideways. And then, of course, we waited. The last challenge was to move back to the frozen command module and power up its controls before the final flight to Earth. This required the creation of new methods. These methods would usually take months to be created, but they were devised in three straight days by flight controllers under the guidance of flight director Gene Krantz. Mm -hmm. The team on the ground were doing some of the most consequential engineering under a lot of pressure. Every calculation had to be just right. With nine hours to go before re-entry, they were traveling at 32,000 kilometers an hour or 20,000 miles per hour. The crew wrote the instructions on whatever scrap pieces of paper that they could find on board. This takes over two hours. We knew early in the uh, game that the power down levels would approach survival of the crew and the survival of the system. The systems would get so cold that we were worried that possibly the batteries might freeze. The propellant in the command and service module lines would freeze. There was a good chance we would get the uh, combined spacecraft home, but when we brought up the command and service module, it would be non-functional. It was the end of the road. But to everyone's relief... I imagine they got to Earth, they'd done everything, and then it just the battery just did stop working. Just imagine. Bro, <laughs> so many aspects of this, this is ridiculous. As the crew threw the switches to power up the command module, everything booted up. The components had withstood the cold temperatures far beyond their design limits. The crew jettisoned the service module. As the service module drifted away, for the first time, they could see the true extent of the disaster. The whole side had been blown off in the explosion. Oh but now there was another risk. There was a possibility that their heat shield could have been affected by the explosion. If it was damaged in any way, it was likely that they would burn up in the atmosphere. But the crew couldn't think about that right now, as they had to jettison their lunar module lifeboat. It was time for re-entry. The flight finally entered the Earth's atmosphere. A communications blackout was supposed to last for three minutes as they turned into a glowing orb in the sky. What? When the blackout didn't end after that, Everybody monitoring on Earth became extremely anxious. It was looking like the crew had perished upon re-entry. Then suddenly, the words OK Joe were heard. After they crossed through the atmosphere, the crew deployed their parachutes successfully. They had done it. A huge sigh of relief could be felt by all. Finally, they splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on April 17th after 142 hours, 54 minutes and 41 seconds of a perilous journey. Wait, wait. Finally, they I'm splashed kidding. down in the Pacific Ocean on April 17th after 142 hours, 54 minutes and 41 seconds of a perilous journey. Mate. All three flight members got home safe and a million prayers from around the globe had been answered. <sighs> This is nuts. I can't get my head around this. This is absolutely blowing my mind. <sighs> Mate, this is ridiculous. I can't, I'm just repeating, I don't know what to say. It's just mental, man. How, I mean, again, like I've said, I've heard about this story, but I've never actually, like, looked at this for some reason. This is one of the most, like, mind-numbing, just craziness, the most crazy story I've ever heard about anything, ever. It's just mental. The Apollo 13 Accident Review Board investigated the disaster and later identified the reason being a short circuit. It was discovered that when fuel tank number one was modified to be fitted in the Apollo 13 spaceflight, the voltage to the heaters in the oxygen tanks were raised from 28 volts to 65 volts DC. Unfortunately, 
the thermostatic switches on the heaters weren't modified to suit the change. The final test on the launch pad damaged the Teflon insulation on the tank, leading to the risk of a short circuit, which in turn caused the explosion. The command module is now kept in the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center in Kansas, wow. while the lunar module is believed to have burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. The three crew members didn't get a chance to land on the moon again, but mission commander James Lovell became the first person to travel to the moon twice. Even though Apollo 13 couldn't complete its mission of landing on the moon, it's called a successful failure. A successful failure because NASA managed to bring the entire crew safely back to Earth yeah, on a damaged I mean, spacecraft. The mission gave several lessons to the space agency in terms of engineering and spacecraft design. This ensured future successes of Apollo missions. The story of Apollo 13 showcases the best of engineering and thinking on one's feet. Bringing three men back home from 200,000 miles out in space is a story for all time. If you do enjoy this channel, then I'm sure you enjoy it. Here's the ad. Here is his ad. And shout out for him to get him, for getting his money. This is at the right point. Because this is an insane video, mate. This is insane. I'm going to subscribe to him. I don't know what other videos he does. But if any of, if this video is anything to go by, I'm going to love his channel. Let's see some of the comments. I was sweating watching this and my heart was going crazy even though it happened 50 years ago. Imagine what the crew was feeling during the time, honestly. Imagine doing maths on the broken spaceship to get, to get back home. This is insane. The amount of engineering challenges in order to save these great men is unfathomable. Meanwhile, Flat Earth still exists. Gee, a story like this makes me realise how little I've challenged and how little I've accomplished. A rookie who left his wife and kids. Ooh, on Earth, Jesus called you. The, this deserves Oscar in storytelling. Mate, this was incredible. This video was in, like, immense, man. Pressing buttons for the oxygen tank in a spaceship is a practical joke because it's funny noises, love, as you can't be serious. <laughs> Humans will be humans, bro. Another free video by the Goat Fu Cold Fusion. Keep it up, man. These videos have got so much to cover. I want to see what other videos he posts. And just seeing if these maybe I could do some reactions to some other, some other videos of his because I really enjoyed this one, man. I really, really did enjoy this one. Well, let's see his most viewed. I don't know if this is going to say anything. I mean, yeah, I'll be down to see if people want these reactions. But yeah, let me know about this. Were you alive when this happened? Do you remember this like on sort of being televised or whatever? about it like do you remember this being on tv sort of watching this live because this must have been crazy in person to see this like to watch this again 50 years later blows my mind so watching this at the point when it actually happened must have been just i can't i can't even describe it bro but this is an insane insane story and thank god they got back to earth because from what he said and all the issues and the scenario that they were in there seemed like no chances at all i initially thought they didn't come back to earth but obviously they did and thank god they did but hopefully you enjoy this one more space reactions comment down below what you want to see and until next time like subscribe